Thanks for the introduction. Is the sound okay? It, it sounds a little weird because it's speaking right into my ear, but I guess you get used to it. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk at MLSS, and this is, looks like an even bigger group than you. It's fantastic. And this is my first time talking in this room, so that's pretty exciting. And what I'd like to tell you about today is a pretty big story. Uh, let me move away from this. I'm going to try. Uh, it's a pretty big story about modeling the human body and how it moves. And I'll tell you a little bit why we're interested in this and why it might be a fun thing to do. Uh, hopefully, this this is not a mass heavy lecture. This is going to be hopefully a lot of fun. And I encourage you to ask mass fun to anyway. But uh, a lot of interesting pictures, and um, maybe I inspire you to think about this problem and to think about applying machine learning in new ways to similar problems and similar data. At the end, I'll show you a lot of resources online that um, if you're interested in, in trying out some of this data, your own methods, uh, you can get access. So before I get started, I want to point out that this is a fairly long effort going back to when I was a professor at Brown, which is now more than six and a half years ago, and has involved many people uh, here in, in proceeding systems department, and, and some of them came from Brown. And here are just a few of the faces. And as we go through, I'll, I'll highlight the work of different people in the group. Some of this work also spun out into a startup company called Body Labs in New York, and this is um, the group there, uh, and I'll show you some examples of their work and how this, this technology is being commercialized. But I want you to start and first think about the internet as a metaphor for the real world. In many cases, this works great. You know, you, uh, you can uh, look up stock prices and check the weather, and I, I don't know, there's, the internet does, provides a lot of services that work just great. Um, but it sometimes fails, and it fails as a metaphor for our, our physical world when our bodies are involved. And a lot of things that we use our bodies for every day, one of them is, is social interactions. And so in the real world, we have these rich physical experiences um, that really just are not quite as satisfying somehow in, uh, in the virtual world. Meetings in the real world are just better. I mean, I don't know how many times you've probably struggled to Skype and other things, and uh, these VR avatars are nothing like uh, interacting with real people in a, in a meeting. Um, in the virtual world, you can have a virtual assistant like Siri or Alexa. This is my assistant, Melanie, and I tell you she's much better than Alexa. Uh, there's just no comparison. And one, a really obvious one is if you, if you try to shop for clothes, I, um, I hate shopping for clothes on the web because I never know does it fit me. I can't try it on. Uh, it's just, this is why people don't shop so much clothing. Because you don't have your body with you and there's no way for that shopping experience to mimic the shopping experience in the field. So the idea is actually to think of something like the phone or any, any camera or sensing device as a portal between the real world and this virtual. So what we want to be able to do is somehow transport you into the virtual world so that your experience on the web and virtual reality, et cetera, is as rich and as embodied as your experience in the real world. So uh, a piece of this, this is not the only piece, but a piece of this is what I'll call pixels in and some kind of replica of yourself um, out. And, and so this is something from Body Labs right now uh, where you take in a video shot on a cell phone, just handheld. Uh, they analyze the, um, uh, the 2D and 3D motion of the body. They produce a 3D avatar of this person capturing the person's shape and their 3D motion. And it's accurate enough to do things like shop for clothing. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we get there from pixels to avatar. Now you might think this is easy because if you use Snap or Facebook's recent filters, it looks like this problem is solved for faces, right? You know, you, you can have a live video feed and you can put some 3D graphics on your face and it looks, it looks good. And, but I would argue that our faces are not so different, right? The, the structure of our faces is similar. They're more similar than they are different. And it's why early, very early methods in computer vision using machine learning succeeded on faces. Um, some of the earliest examples really are earliest examples of using PCA are on faces, earliest examples of boosting is on faces, uh, and of course lots of uh, deep learning methods on faces. 
And so these solutions have existed for a long time. I'm going to argue that the human body is much more complex. Well, your face is part of your body, so by definition, if we can include the face, your body is more complex. But people uh, have, the whole body has about 600 muscles, a couple hundred bones, a couple hundred joints. People don't even agree on how many joints there are body, and those joints are many different types. Our body shape changes throughout our lives. It changes throughout the day. It changes uh, from before you had lunch to after you had lunch. And we cover ourselves in all kinds of clothing that obscures our shape and our pose. This makes us a much more challenging revision problem to go from pixels in and analysis of 3D shape out. So I'm going to take you through this, but our approach to this is to formulate a generative model of the body. And this is what, uh, this is an example, uh, two examples actually. So here we have a virtual avatar on the left, female on the right, male. And uh, they, they should look pretty real to you. They should look like a real person. The deformations, particularly at places like the shoulders, should look natural and realistic to you. Realistic muscle bulging, the knees should look real. But that's not enough to do computer vision with them or to use these things in graphics. They need to have a small number of parameters. They have to be easy for an animator to animate. And most importantly for me is they have to be easy to fit to data. So I'll take you through a little bit of, of how we do this. So think about, so a body model is going to be a function. This function takes pose theta, some parameters which I'll describe, shape theta, some other parameters I'll describe, maybe something about the dynamics of the body over time, and maybe a texture map or other. So it's going to take these things and it's going to produce a 3D meshes output. Uh, this is a scan of this person. Um, I'm sorry, this is a scan of the person. This is the ground truth 3D shape. I won't tell you how I got that. And this is a simulation of them. This is a, an animated avatar going through a, a range of poses that this person never did, but it should always look. Now, the generative part of this is that we want a model that we can actually uh, use in a wide uh, range of situations. So we're going to, this function, remember, is a mesh, a 3D mesh. I'll describe that in a second. And then we can imagine a, a rendering engine. What's a rendering engine? Well, in this case, in the, the standard case, you might take a 3D mesh object, some lighting, some camera parameters, and then this would project this into the image to uh, something that looks like this. Yeah. So this is just a rendering of a textured mesh um, as an image. But we can render all kinds of things. So when I sit, talk about uh, this generative process or the rendering process, I, I'm talking about not just images, but maybe inertial measurements, uh, linguistic descriptions, um, uh, certainly images, range scans, videos, et cetera. Let's see some examples. So the advantage of having one of these rich generative models is once I've defined it, it's really easy then to Multi use it for multiple purposes. So here, uh, one example of rendering out 3D uh, dots or 2D dots, rendering out a depth map, rendering out a full 3D mesh, or rendering out images. Uh, this means that once I've defined my model, if I'm given a new problem, I'm just going to be able to make some small changes and then use my model to, to solve the problem, as we'll see. So. For people who aren't familiar with your graphics and meshes and so on, this is a triangulated mesh with about 7,000 vertices in it. That's a relatively low dimensional mesh. Uh, it's segmented into parts. We did that by hand, though we've done work on learning those, that segmentation. And, and, the, and as I'll show you in a minute, that um, each of these parts can rotate uh, in a kinematic chain. So the parts rotate relative to the parent part. And there are some weights, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, represented by this color coding. Now, the approach we're going to take is a factored approach. And this is partly due to the fact we don't have a whole lot of training data, as you can see. Uh, and so we're going to break body shape into different factors, different components. One of them is going to be the identity of the person. So here you see body shape changing, changing some parameters beta that I'll tell you about in a minute. And you should see the pose is fixed, but this, the woman is changing. Uh, then we also separately learn a pose space. So here the identity of the person should look the same. She should look like the same person to you, but her pose is changed. And then we can combine these two things, and we're going to do this in an oddly additive way. 
not exactly what you might want, but actually works. Uh, and so we have pose and shake varying simultaneously. This idea goes back to some work from Stanford called SCAPE from Frago Angelov, uh, I think Daphne Kohler, and uh, uh, Sebastian Thronfall also called. Uh, but there's lots of other kinds of deformations that we model, and I won't talk about breathing today, but I'll talk about dynamics as well. So we're going to have this factored model, which is going to simplify the learning process and allow us to use a lot less training data than we learned before. So the idea is we're going to collect a whole lot of 3D scans of people. So we're going to collect thousands of 3D scans that look like this. Uh, you can see there's a bit, some noise here. But there's a wide variety of body shapes and uh, ages, um, both genders. It's not kept, we're not capturing every kind of person in the world. We don't have amputees and uh, we don't have children. But capturing a, a, a big swath of the adult population uh, spanning uh, different ethnicities, different countries, and so on. So thousands of people. And then we're going to get hundreds of people in hundreds of poses, or at least tens of poses. And uh, so we have a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of poses. And maybe you saw the scanner downstairs. It was designed to capture a full range of human motion. So we should have, be able to have a fairly tall person come in and stand like this and be able to capture their shape. And you see we've got older people and heavy people and, and fit and so So we want to capture the variety of, of, uh, of body shapes as they deform in motion. And then we want to combine both of these data sets together into this function. We want to learn this function M that's going to produce meshes uh, as out. Now the problem with this is that the scans we get are just an unordered set of 3D points. They're just points. And and so, uh, you know, this person has a different number of points than this person, and they're not at all in correspondence. So if we want to start doing something like machine learning, we need to first put all of these meshes into, into correspondence with each other. So this is not as nice as like having an image um, where you've got a grid laid out for you. There's no predefined topology for the data that you get. Now, I'm going to talk about using this, it's called the Caesar data set, uh, which has a couple thousand men and a couple thousand women from the US and Europe. The first step of this work is going to be mesh registration. This is putting them all into correspondence. I'll just briefly step through that. So given two meshes like this, you'd like to know the correspondence between them. Here, if I know the correspondence, I can provide, I've just color-coded the, the vertices. So, you know, the vertices correspond, et cetera. That's what we would like to be able to do. But the problem is really actually not so easy because, for example, there are fundamental ambiguities here, on this guy's stomach, uh, where does that go on this guy's stomach? What's the same point? For some things like the belly button or the tip of the nose, you might say, well, that makes sense. I know where that goes. But for other parts of the body, it's not so clearly defined. So you might want to, might need to regularize that in a sense. Right? Uh, the other thing is we, we can look pretty different in different poses. And uh, sometimes there's missing data, like this guy's butt is completely missing because it was sticking outside the scanner. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, the self-contact causes problems and just, you know, this scan looks really pretty different than this scan. So we want to put them all in response. By that, I mean we're going to take a common template mesh, the pink thing, T star here, and we want to bring it into alignment with the blue thing, which is a scan. And you can see that the, maybe that the pink thing is a little bit lower resolution. 7,000 vertices as opposed to maybe 150,000 points. Um, and you can see that the scan is missing some data down here in the foot. Uh, and we, we're going to do this for thousands of scans, so it has to be fully automatic. And uh, it also has to be for accurate. And the idea here was if I already had a model of the human body, this would be pretty easy. It's, if I had a low dimensional model, I would just search over the parameters, try and fit it to the data. Um, while being robust to missing. And then, given that fit, I could then see how the, the meshes I actually observe deviate from my model, and then update my model uh, to better fit the data. But this assumes that I have uh, aligned data to build a model in the first place, so we have sort of chicken and egg situation. And so our approach to this was something we called co-registration, which was to formulate a big, crazy objective function with the model and the alignment 
uh, the registration of the scans all in one objective and try to solve the whole thing at once. Sometimes making a problem harder uh, makes it more solvable. Uh, so this is what we do. Uh, this is just another example of aligning um, uh, a template by first. It's a little more complex than I described. There's kind of a course fine search over the parameter space and so on to, and we've got some priors on pose uh, that make this track. But the result is you take scans in, you get automatically 3D fitted uh, meshes out, and these meshes are now in correspondence. So a vertex on the nose of one person that corresponds to the same vertex number on the nose of all the thousands of other people in thousands. So now we can start doing something with this. They're in correspondence. Um, there's one other little detail, which is that even though the Caesar data set, people are mostly standing in the same pose. They're not exactly in the same pose. And so we need some pose complication. But once I have, um, say, in this case, 4,000 people, 1,000 men, 1,000 women in the same pose, I can just do some simple things. I can compute the average uh, of the vertices. But these are the average people in uh, average male and average woman in this, in this data set. And it's the average, probably. Uh, you may also remember that the very first time you learned about a normal distribution, people, uh, the example people gave you was probably height of humans. Even though it's tru not truly Gaussian, it, it does kind of look like a, a, a normal distribution. Weight also is kind of like a normal, it's a little bit skewed nowadays, uh, the heavier weights. Um, and so the first thing you might think about is, well, we could do PCA on this data and get a reasonable model for everything Gaussian, which it isn't, but it's not a bad approximation. So what we're going to do is take our template mesh. We have this deformation of the template mesh to each of the scans. Uh, so that looks like these things. Uh, we're going to subtract the mean, vectorize this uh, data, put it in a matrix, do principal component analysis on it. And so we're going to come up with a low dimensional uh, subspace U, and so using this and the mean, we can reconstruct using some linear coefficients beta here, uh, an approximation to any of the scans in the training set. And the beta here, we tend to use about 10 principal components to describe body shape. For most of the applications, I'll show you that's sufficient. Uh, and captures, I don't know, 90 percent of the variance. So here's just some examples of the first few principal components of female body shape. And uh, you should notice that the pose is not, should not be changing. Factored that out. So this really should only be shape variation. Um, oops, I, I didn't, I, I thought I had men in, well, I, I didn't know. Um, but you know, it's height and weight and various other proportions of the body. And it does a reasonable job of capturing shape. Of, any questions? So, Okay, good. Um, please feel free to stick your hand up and interrupt me. Some there. Uh, we also did this alignment for, in this case, 1,800 um, poses of uh, 1,800 scans of 60 people in a wide range of poses. That's what this looks like. And the story for how we build a model of, of how people deform is just a little bit more complex than the PCA story. So I have to walk. Um, because our pose is clearly not linear, um, and so we're going to need some other kind of representation. And this is some work on uh, Matt Loper's PhD thesis here at the Institute on the topic. Uh, and there's a long history in this going back, but this, this Caesar data set came out in about 2003, and then the first papers came out uh, the year after on modeling body shape. But this work from 2006 was an attempt to model how people uh, change uh, shape and pose, and it was all learned from data. Now this looks pretty bad, I have to say. It was actually a very nice model, but they, it was super complicated, very hard to train. They didn't have a lot of training data, and they clearly didn't, you know, solve for it. Well. So sometimes having a complex model, even if it's kind of the right thing, can make your life hard. This was the work from Angolov I mentioned before from Stanford, and this was the, this really got me thinking a lot about this being possible. Uh, they had also a small data set, but they were able to represent human shape and pose pretty accurately and pretty believably, and they, they showed some really nice applications. There were some problems with this, though, in 
that this kind of model was a little complex and not at all like what the graphics people used and was hard to, to use the data. It was also a little bit slow. So all the previous models had some kind of problems. I'm not going to go through this. So we proposed one that doesn't have any problems, right? So our goals were uh, it had to be efficient, accurate, uh, compatible with current graphics engines, and pipelines, and games, video games. Uh, animators wanted a skeleton. The scape model doesn't have one of those. Um, it has to be low dimensional so we can use it in computer vision. And we wanted to keep it really simple so that we could learn it well. I think that's, you know, one of the lessons of uh, deep learning is that sometimes a simple model uh, is much better than a complex model because you can actually learn the parameters well. So that's the same thing. Simple and it's differentiable. So that's the kind of thing. So what is this model? Well, we, we're going to learn a template mesh T. This is going to be about 7,000 vertices three, in 3D. Uh, it's going to look like this. We're going to learn, we need some joints, J. Uh, they're shown here as white dots. And we're going to learn some weights, which I'll tell you about in a minute, of how uh, each part influences vertices and mesh as the body um, moves. Our shape parameters are just what I, these principal components, I, our shape, blend shapes, we'll call them, are the principal components I just showed you. So here we're moving through a range of shapes, but you notice that the white dots are moving along with, it. so the joints, it turns out, are going to be a function of body shape. You're going to have to learn that function. So clearly as you move, the joints uh, move with you, uh, or as you change shape, you're going to change shape with you. So, and then we're going to have a, what's called a skinning function W. This is not a learned function. This is a traditional thing called, in our case, we're going to take linear blend skinning, but linear blend skinning, all kinds of things. But we, this is a predefined thing that the graphics people already like. So we're going to take what the graphics people like from linear blend skinning function. We're going to learn the T. We're going to learn the J. We're going to learn the W. And then given some uh, theta parameters, we can repose the model, apply blend skinning, uh, and get out vertices. I'll show you that in just a second. And the, the parameterization of the body is going to be this kinematic tree uh, with a root someplace here, and then uh, relative part rotation. So these, um, uh, yeah, some relative part rotations. I'm not going to detail about how we um, So linear blend skinning is, does the following thing. So given a, a, a template mesh like this and some blend weights, W, we're going to repose the body. And then we want to define a vertex on this posed body. And that's going to be, it's going to take vertices on the, uh, on the original body for different parts, rotated using the joints, J, which have to still be learned, and then a weighted combination. So different parts will influence a vertex um, and its, end, its eventual 3D location um, in, to different degrees. So if I'm in the middle of this part, Probably only this part influences it. If I'm on the boundary, multiple parts may influence the, the final vertex location. But what you notice is this thing doesn't look very good. So if I take this mesh and I rotate the parts and apply linear blend skinning, I get some well-known artifact, this sort of collapse here. It's also something called the candy wrapper effect, well-known linear blend skinning. So artists use this all the time in making movies and so on. But what they do is they'll say, ah, this pose looks really crappy. Uh, so then they'll go in by hand and they'll change this mesh. They'll just deform it. They'll just add some what's called a blend shape to it. And then such that the blend shape makes everything look good once you apply blend skinning. And artists, every time they, you know, they pose Spider-Man and he doesn't look good, the director says, well, that looks terrible. And the artist goes in and adds a new blend shape. Um, and then they have to combine all these blend shapes, and then they, they end up with hundreds of them, and it gets very unwieldy. So our idea was maybe we could just learn these blend shapes from our scans. So what we want to learn is if I'm going to put somebody in a pose like this, it should actually look like a scan of somebody in a pose like this, and I should learn what the uh, deformation I should apply to my template mesh is such that I'll get the right result. So that's what we do. Uh, and here's an example of what these deformations look like. Here's the, the posed mesh, and here's the template mesh being deformed according to the pose of the body. And these, I'm not gonna go into full detail of, of this, but you can see that the shoulders and the elbows and the, probably the hips and so on are deforming. Uh, and then the final result, once it's posed within your plan scanning, should be.
These are just actually a linear function of parameters of the part rotation matrices, and I don't. Yep. Um, but the final thing then is uh, this function m I said we would define, which takes in pose and shape parameters. And now linear blend skinning w is applied to a template mesh, which is a function. That's this thing, which is a function of the shape parameters beta and the pose beta, because we're going to apply these pose blend shapes. Uh, a regressor J, which I'm not going to tell you about, which takes the shape of the body and joints, um, the blend weights, which we've learned, the theta parameters, and this output is the final uh, So skip that. So we're going to learn this. There's a lot of parameters. Um, yeah. So you want. <laughs> so I said I'm going to keep it really simple. Uh, it's about as simple a model as we could formulate. Uh, this was a lot of parameters to learn, and so it has to be regular on spell. And I detail that. But the results are a mesh that you can animate, you can change the body shape um, if it's quite plausible, plugs directly into Blender or, or Unity or Unreal Engine, Maya, um, and so it's relatively easy. Now, any questions so far on what we're doing and why? Yeah. So uh, there is no physics. So it's like all yeah. everything they like they look all balanced in the sense that they wouldn't like collapse in any way. Right. But this is only because you match the mesh of pose to yeah, like what they and super so. question. Uh so there's a couple elements to that. There is no physics here, indeed. Uh what I was showing you there was animation using motion capture data. So that was taking a human in a mocap suit and transferring motion. Uh, tell you briefly about it at the end. Uh, cute but there was indeed no physics. And uh, so we don't know anything about balancing. And we also don't know anything about soft tissue deformation. That we'll see that in just a good, good point we come back. OK. Uh, sorry. How do we learn that? How do, the question is, how do we learn these deformations, the, the pose-dependent deformations? So remember, we have uh, 1,800 scans. Uh, I can take my very simple body model with, uh, with just linear blend skinning and the crappy joints. Right? I fit it to 1,800 scans, and then I see how far away I am. That gives me a displacement at every vertex and a different pose. So now I have training data. I've got poses of the body and errors, basically, displacements. And so I want to learn a function that maps from one of those. And I want to make that a simpler function. Uh, there's all kinds of things you could do if you've got enough data. 1,800 is not that. 1,800 examples, but I've got 7,000 vertices and 72 uh, pose parameters. So you might not want to use deep learning on it just yet, but might also. But so we do something very, very simple. And it's, um, yeah. Does that answer your question well enough? OK. Other. All right. So you might think, well, that looks pretty good. Good enough. Um, you know, we've got bodies. We've got meshes. Everything looks pretty good so far. Uh, except this is what we actually look like on the left. Um, and this is what our model looks like. So physics is now starting to take over here. And if you, you know, okay, um, you know, I always say everybody jiggles. We have protocols in the lab that we bring you in. We can make you jiggle. Uh, so if you want to come, <laughs> if you want to sign a human subjects form and come do it, uh, you're welcome to. So we would like to be able to capture a little bit more of, of the of the real soft tissue of the body and how it. So uh, there has been work on, on this in the past. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but it's not very realistic. And if the body doesn't look realistic, we don't believe it. And, and so there's sort of the problem really is that I can capture. I want to capture something about how bodies deform as a function of time. But in time, all I can capture is this sort of typical sparse motion capture data. And if I want dense 3D data, I have to have a person basically standing still. 
So what I really want is something in between, which is 4D data, that is the 3D shape of the body as a function of time. And so this is a scan out of our, our 4D scanner, some of you saw. Um, and uh, this thing is a, uh, uses 66 cameras, two, uh, a set of stereo cameras and then a color camera. Uh, the stereo has a, a speckled projection to make it easier to solve the stereo problem. And then we get out of this pretty nice soft tissue motions of the body. And you can see in this, um, yeah, waves propagating through the soft tissue. Um, and, and this is the way we make people. Uh, so we actually capture people doing all kinds of things in this. And um, then again, we have this alignment problem. But now we're doing this at 60 frames a second. So we're getting really hundreds of thousands of scans of people. So we want to bring them into correspondence very precisely. And here's an example of our aligned meshes. Now we extend that co-registration idea across time um, to bring them into correspondence. And this looks okay, and then you can see soft tissue motion waves propagating the tissues. Uh, but it turns out it wasn't good enough. And, and in some recent work, we've taken it up a notch. Um, we did some, this is our original work on aligning the body. And what you see is this looks pretty soft tissue-y, but there's still a lot of residual jiggle going on. This is the template mesh, mesh of, um, this is the, uh, the texture of the person mapped onto the body. And it's not really stable in time. And uh, so we really want to stabilize that. And we extended our registration technique to use the image texture. So on the, uh, let me go back a second. So what you're going to see here is on the, the right here, alignment without texture, on the left, alignment with texture. And they look pretty similar. But if I show them to you side by side, here is the stabilized texture of the body when we use texture information. And you can see that these little marks we painted on the person's stomach are pretty dead stable. And without that, they're not. So we're finally capturing, every time it's uh, uh, pink, it's without texture, and blue is with texture. So lots of motion, now no motion. Uh, so we really think we're now capturing the soft tissue motion of the body pretty precisely by using both geometry. Uh, you can see her face bouncing up and down here in the beginning, and then it gets nicely stabilized. Um, so anyway, we spent a lot of time doing this. Really, like this was so much work. Uh, this is so hard to get the data right. But now that we've got the data uh, and we're going to share it with people, uh, we can start to build models. And again, the, to come back to the physics thing and point out there's no physics here yet. What we do is uh, we have these now registered 3D, 4D scans. We have our simple body model, which doesn't capture this dynamics. And then we can look at the differences uh, here registered to a, a, a template pose. And the only thing you should see here, then, are the soft tissue motions propagating through the, the tissue. This really lets you isolate the soft tissue. And now we come back to the learning question. Given uh, meshes like this, which are deformations, deviations from uh, the simple model, and pose over time, I want to learn a function that takes me from pose over time and maybe the previous soft tissue uh, deformations to the new soft tissue deformations. So to do that, we use a second-order autoregressive model. We call the thing dimple for dynamic simple. We take in the shape of the body beta. We take in a sequence of poses. We use the preceding uh, couple time instants of pose, as well as the preceding uh, uh, two um, uh, delta parameters. I haven't actually put delta in I think now. The delta is, the, is just like our beta shape parameter but it's a low dimensional representation of the deformations in this uh, soft tissue space. It turns out, of course, we all jiggle a little bit differently. So this pure factored model I told you about before doesn't really apply here. We have to learn a model that jiggles differently depending on your uh, body shape. We do something very simple, which we use body mass index, and uh, we have a bunch of training data with different body mass index. It's not a great measure of body fat and how jiggly you are, but it was good enough to get a proof of concept. And then we, uh, for a new test subject, we compute how similar they are to all of the training subjects in terms of BMI, and then we linearly combine weighted way the, uh, the, the jiggliness of, of the training subject. Uh, lots of little details there. But the result is, um, again, a, 
a function m, which now takes in a template mesh that joins the weights and theta, the pose, which is now a theta over time, and adds in the soft tissue dynamics uh, to get something quite plausible. This generalizes relatively well to things you haven't seen before, uh, but there is no physics here. So if I take the person and turn them upside down and shake them or, or put them in outer space, something that I've never seen before, you won't get the right result. Uh, so I have a few hidden slides on how you, um, how you fix that, but here's just an example of ground truth registrations and then uh, the dimple model. This doesn't match exactly because we're not fitting this data. It's uh, uh, just a simulation, uh, just a prediction from the, from the model. That looks pretty weak. Before I go on, any questions about dynamics? Like how is this close or like it depend on like maybe like tissue has a like similar property different depending mm -hmm. on like head and how much muscle is gone. Yeah. But like usually we're closed uh, in some different way. Um how good does the model generalize this spec? Yeah, it's a good question. If you look around the room, oh, everybody's wearing clothes. Uh, so uh, clearly, this model is um, maybe we need to do something more. Now, there's there's one place where we're all not wearing clothes right now, and that's mm -hmm. our hands, right? Uh, so uh, let me I'll come back to your clothing question in just a minute, but I want to talk about hands first, since they're they're naked almost all the time, um, and they turn out to be really important. So, you know, I've been talking about bodies. I haven't talked about faces. I haven't talked about clothes. I haven't talked about hair, but hands are. Uh, let's forget the face for a minute. Hands are super important. We communicate with them. We manipulate the world with them. If we want to understand humans, um, if we really want to understand humans in natural environments and humans communicating with each other, we need to understand hands and bodies together. Now, all the previous work I showed you, uh, the hands you may not have noticed, but they look pretty rigid. Either Scape had these fists and we have these open palms. You know, people don't do that. So we would like a model of the hand and how it moves. There's a lot of work going on doing this. Typically in RGBD, they tend to focus only on the hand. Uh, Oculus had this nice demo of disembodied hands. The reason they do this is they don't actually know how to capture the whole body and do the whole kinematic chain and including the hands. So every, everyone here is focused just on the hand or just on the body. No one's put two together. It seems kind of crazy to me. So uh, we have done that. So this is some work with uh, Javier Romero and uh, look, Sorry, going backwards. And it's, it's, uh, maybe some of that. We basically took the same approach that uh, we did for bodies. We scanned, in this case, uh, 2018 scans of hands from 31 subjects, men and women, uh, doing a wide range of poses, including grasping objects. Here are just some images. These are the scans, but they're just uh, projected on a black background. They come with texture on uh, and then we do the same uh, co-registration process to align them all, getting uh, 3D registrations that look like this. This then becomes our training data. And we're going to do the same thing we did before, which is have a factored model of pose and shape. So here's the shape space, principal components of hand shape variation. Um, and then we learn, uh, we do something slightly different here in learning the uh, pose space. Uh, uh, so here we don't have, these are sort of global pose blend shapes. We, we actually make this much more local. We have a define a local model. But you see that this is pretty natural looking when you move uh, the hand in part from when it does things that violate kinematic constraints. But we'll deal with that in just a second. We then learn a pose space. This is just using PCA because uh, lots of people have shown that you can do PCA on hand poses with the first six components captured. It's not a great model. I wouldn't really recommend this, but the literature is full of it, so we, we did it. So we have a, a low D PCA model of hand poses. And this is kind of dumb. We're doing you know PCA in the space of art locations. Um, really not the right. But come back to that later after. 
So now uh, that hand model uses the same topology as our regular mesh that I showed you already for simple. So we can basically just graft it on there and then we can solve for the body pose and the hand pose simultaneously. So here are example scans in, in this gold color and here are the 3D registrations uh, to those scans. So we fit the, the model to the scans and then update it. Now you probably, so what I wanna show you is like if you look at the scans, uh, our scanner gets kind of uh, noisy when the hands get near the boundaries of the scanning volume. And so you can see that sometimes there's almost no information about the hand present. And yet we recover by having a low dimensional model that we can fit, we get a reasonable hand pose out um, here again, uh, here. And, and so now we take in scans, the golder scans, and you can see that there's sometimes missing data, like she's kicking here, a lot of missing data. And then we recover the 3D pose of the body together with the hands. This gives us for the first time the ability to understand bodies and hands uh, doing things. This is not supernatural, but um, uh, at least it's so widely buried. And, and then this is, the, this is a, a model so she's artificial, but she, she's fit to data. Uh, and she, this was, we had these artists come in doing very emotive dances. And uh, here you can see that hand motion really becomes a part of her expression and it's captured by the model. So this is where we're moving towards, towards having 3D avatars like this that really have a, a lifeless, a life, aliveness. Liveliness, I guess is what I want. A liveliness that you believe that this is a real person, um, which is a little bit different from, say, video game avatars. So, uh, any questions? All right, let me use the model now since um, time is marching on. So, I remember I said we, we spent all this effort to collect all this data and then we built a model of the body that we could then render in all kinds of ways. So this is going to be the game. And um, the forward rendering process for an image is, is you take your mesh, you take uh, some lights, you take a camera parameter, some camera parameters, and, and then you, you render an image. And I can't actually tell you whether this is a real image or a synthetic image because they kind of look the same. Um, but in general, we want to take an image like this and uh, do the inverse rendering process. So given an image or a sequence of these, solve for the parameters beta, theta, a, k, l, et cetera, or some of them will be given, some of them will be unknown, uh, but we want to invert this process. Right? That's the classic version of computer vision as inverse graphics, literally inverse graphics. Now, there are a bunch of techniques. So the first real demonstration of doing this was the work of Glance and Better, SIGGRAPH 99, which is a super nice, uh, they did this whole thing it was pretty hard and uh, um, just for faces. Others have uh, Della Gorce at all this for hands. And they did something called differentiable rendering. But they did it in a very specific case. They broke down a very specific rendering equation for this specific problem. They differentiated through it and then they did gradient descent one form or another to solve. Uh, we did something different, which is we created something called OpenDR, which is an open differentiable renderer. And the idea was basically take, take a a rendering engine um, and uh, and auto diff it, right? And so that's uh, what we did. Parts of it we hand coded because it was too slow and auto diffed it. Uh, and it's built on something called Jumpy, which is a auto diff framework. And it's pretty handy. It's open source, and we use it for lots of things. It's a little bit slow. People often do the, it's very easy to prototype a, a forward rendering process, differentiate it, optimize it. Open DR, uh, and then if you really want it to be fast, you can figure it out it works. But we use this for everything, and so I'll show you an example of going from to get 3D bodies from RGB D data. So RGB is our red, green, blue, and D is depth, and and Connect was the first commercial, ex popular commercial example of RGB D. Amazon just released the uh, Amazon Look or Echo Look, which has an RGB sensor. The data you get from one of these things looks sort of like this. This is viewed from the side. Uh, you get very noisy point clouds um, where you only observe part of the body. 
you get higher resolution color from the RGB. But we wanted to be able to reconstruct 3D body shape and pose from this data and do it accurately. So now I'm going to ask you the skill testing question. Uh, you've seen our, our fancy scanner. And now we're going to build a body scanner just by tracking someone dancing around in front of one of these connect sensors. Um, and uh, so one of these scans comes from our million dollar scanner, uh, either green or beige. And the other one comes from the $100 uh, Echo Connect in this case. Who thinks that the million dollar scanner is the beige one? All right. Who thinks the million dollar scanner is the green one? Oh, you guys could. You notice that the million dollar scanner has all kinds of artifacts. Uh, maybe, I don't know. The million dollar scanner has all these mistakes, uh, which the Connect scanner doesn't have. And that's because the Connect scanner uses a strong model of the body to solve the problem. Uh, people aren't usually that good at this. Uh, okay. But uh, anyway, there's a lot of work on re recovering human shape from uh, RGBD, uh, often focusing on s small motions of part of the body. Uh, we really want to deal with stuff like this, where people just kind of come in and dance around in front of it. And what you're seeing here is a set of processing steps. The raw data, the blue thing is the, the initial shape model fit to the body. Then there's a high resolution phase where we pull out high resolution shape detail, and then there's a text phase. And this is all just captured from uh, the single uh, depth sensor. So for the high resolution texture, in addition to our, our our 7,000 vertices, we add a, a displacement map here. This is, this is a relatively high resolution relative to the mesh displacement map uh, that we're going to solve for. And we add a even higher resolution texture map for all. And then I'm going to sort of skip through how we do it um, and just show you some results. Uh, so this is the input image. You see the body sometimes goes out of the field of view of the camera. This is what the Connect returns. Uh, we don't use this at all. It's just here to show you what Connect. Uh, it gets screwed up quite a lot and makes all kinds of errors. Uh, here's our recovered 3D uh, mesh model. Uh, this is the same guy in several, this is Javier, in several different examples. And you see his body shape is consistent across uh, different sequences. Um, so he does different motions, and the body is still the same. Um, and the, his motion is tracked pretty accurately, even though it's kind of crazy. This is all using this differentiable rendering technique. Worked in his house also. Uh, um, anyway, so with this, we, we then la we also scanned these people with the million dollar scanner and compared uh, the scans we captured with the Connect to the million dollar scanner and with an average error of two point four million, which is certainly well in which size people uh, Again, a uh, high-risk scanner in our model. Uh, so yeah, so that's the idea there. Um, any questions about RGBP? All right. Well, um, one problem with that is that it, this sort of thing is still kind of restricted to small space, a home environment, an office environment. I really want to understand how people move in the wild and what they do. So for that, we want to track people outside, maybe track them all day, and do motion capture. Um, really, in, 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 in like I, I want to mocap all of you. I mean, I know all you're doing is just sitting here. Uh, but that's what you do a lot of the day, and I'd like to know that. I'd like to have statistics of that. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, capture people's motion from a sparse set of inertial measurement units. I am. This is some work with Gerard von Small, who's made, oh, you guys probably haven't met him, uh, but he's a uh, senior scientist. So an IMU gives us back uh, information about acceleration. So it's a small, like I've got some kind of IMU in my watch, right? Um, it gives us back acceleration, and it gives us back the orientation relative to gravity. And so we get nine degrees of freedom from from each of these. And people have looked at doing motion capture from these in the past. But typically, they put on lots of these markers all over the body, and it's quite cumbersome. Uh, this is not something you're just going to, like, all of you are not going to wear this coming to this meeting. Right? So this is sort of impractical. 
So we said, what's the smallest number of IMUs that you could wear that would give you infra constrain the body, its motion, and would be practical? So if you had one on your in your shoes, in each shoe, if you could wear if you're willing to wear one of these wristbands, maybe you're willing to wear two. If I put one on your belt, you probably wouldn't notice it, and maybe your glasses or your hat. So this would cover all the end effectors, so the head, the arms, the feet, and then you'd have a root as a reference. So this is sort of a minimal set of IMUs that you could wear that you could hope to produce uh, some motion capture. The question is, how well could you do this? Um, and uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go through a, this in great detail, but here's an example. Uh, we don't, the images here are just used as reference. We don't use them in any optimization. This guy is wearing these six IMUs. You can't, maybe you can see it, but uh, they're pretty invisible. Uh, and the way we, we, we actually get a laser scan of the guy first, so we have a, a 3D body model. We turn it into a simple body, and you see it captures kind of his subtle motion. Um, and then we, we have this observation. We take the whole sequence, actually, the whole sequence of IMU measurements from these six IMUs, and then we, uh, we say, what is the best possible sequence of motions for the body that would explain the acceleration and orientation of all the IMU? If you do this only for a, a single time instant, of course, it's highly ambiguous. But if you combine you know, a, a second or two of data here, you get a lot of constraint. And if you get the shape of the body right, uh, it works a lot better than just guess a body shape. This isn't perfect. Um, we don't have IMUs on the hands and feet. And so, of course, the hands here are doing kind of the wrong thing. We would like to maybe learn um, how hand pose is related to body pose. Uh, there can be drift in these IMUs, so maybe you could combine this with GPS or something if you're outside. Uh, we have to know the body shape. We have ways to do that. Um, that's easy. And right now, this is an offline approach. We'd love to make this online so that you could use this in a gaming environment. I know I went over that super quickly, but any questions on science stuff? And the basic idea is, you know, once you've got this body model, you can repurpose it here, you know, the rendering IMU database. Yeah, how is it with, like, if you lift something heavy, for example, or, like, if you have this kind of contact with the um, environment, mm -hmm. um, would it be a problem if you only have this uh, six measurement points and your model? Or is this, would it, wouldn't it diverge from, like... No, I see, I, I, I'm not sure. So it's an interesting question. I, I think interacting with objects would be fine as long as they're not made of metal, which messes up the IM. Uh, so uh, picking up a big metal thing might screw things up. But um, of course, if I, you know, say, say I pick up a stick, I'm not going to have any constraints that, that really impose that my hands have to fly along a line. That's some extra information. So you could imagine drift in that. I mean, it's not perfect. So there's um, I guess the way I think about this is in the lab we get you know, super instrumented, we get perfect data, but we don't get very much of it. You know, we get 8, 1,800 scans, we get 1,000 scans, we get a little few seconds here and there. Um, but what if I had you know, really like thousands of hours now of lower quality data? What could I glean from that? So I'm, I'm willing here to give up a little bit of accuracy to get uh, more variety. Yeah. And the hope is that combining these two things, over time, I learn better models of how people actually move and my input. Uh, but you're probably, so the, you, know, you probably, I got to come back to the beginning, which is I said, can we do this from a single image? Because that's kind of the, you know, I don't know, it's not a holy grail. But you would think that you should be able to solve this problem. So given an image like this, uh, can we estimate the 3D pose and shape of the body just using the image? automatic. Uh, that's what we would like to be able to do. And this is some work we presented at ECCB uh, last fall. So one, the fir your first thought is, well, okay, well, that's clear. I'm just going to train a CNN uh, to take these pixels, and it's going to this mash it out. Uh, so we, we tried that in the beginning, and then we had trouble for a variety of reasons. Um, it's hard to you know, CNNs work great in computer vision when you can get humans to label a whole bunch of stuff to do. 
Uh, it's pretty hard for any of us to label this guy's body shape. I mean, how do I describe that? I have some ways to do it, but uh, it's, it's not so easy. And how do I label the 3D pose? That's also not so easy. Um, so we said, okay, that's uh, hard to do that directly, uh, but we can do something else. Uh, it's easy for humans to label 2D joints in, in images, have a lot of data sets for that, and there's several methods to, uh, to estimate these 2D joints. And we use deep cut, but we also now use constant pose machines from uh, CMU. doesn't really matter. They're all pretty good these days. Uh, so now we have 2D joints, and then the question is, can we lift these 2D joints into 3D? Uh, there are several ways you can do that. You can train a CNN to go into 3D joints. Uh, we've done that also, but in this work, we didn't. Um, we took a different approach. We said, uh, give me the 2D joints, and I've got my 3D body model. I'm going to write down an objective function. Okay, this is just using my generative model again and open DR, and then I'm going to solve for the pose and shape of the body that best explain the 2D joints. So uh, the, the objective function, so what I want to estimate is the shape parameters beta, the pose beta, a camera, K, some camera parameters, um, and these uh, given these estimated 2D joints. And so I'm going to define a data term, which is a match between the projected um, joints from the 3D model into the image, and then some priors to regularize the whole thing. I'll tell you about it in a second. So, our 3D body model, remember, defines these joints corresponding to our, we learned where these joints are. So given beta and theta, or just given theta, I know where the joints are. And then if I do theta, I pose the body and I know where the joints are in 3D. So now if I have a projection function and I have a K for the camera, so this is just focal length here, uh, and I'm given an image with 2D joint location, I want to solve for the beta and theta, the pose and shape, the shape and pose of the body, that minimizes the difference between these joints and these joints. So I know the correspondence is it's the right shoulder, this is the right shoulder. Right? And I'm just going to use squared error. Uh, and then this is the, the optimization actually. For, uh, I'll just replay for you. Uh, sorry. Uh, so it kind of gets close and then it refines it. And it's not a bad thing. So, uh, that's what we did um, to make it really work. Uh, a lot of times in computer vision, people show you that they estimate 3D pose of the body using a stick figure. Stick figures are very forgiving. They look great uh, in papers, but then if you actually try and pose the body, you'll notice things like the, you know, that they, they interpenetrate uh, badly. So we, our objective function includes a term, which is also differentiable. So the whole thing's differentiable. Um, that penalizes pen, uh, penetra interpenetrations like this and um, pushes them out so that we get a reasonable pose of the body. Still matches the image. So the, here are some results on the lead sports uh, pose data set. Uh, on the left is the image, the 2D pose detection, and then our estimated 3D shape pose of the body. And they're not, but, but uh, we validated this on all kinds of ground data as well. Of course, it fails when the CNN fails. So um, if you, uh, yeah, if, you, if your CNN does the wrong thing, you just hear the two legs. It didn't find the leg up here, not surprisingly, and get the wrong thing. So nothing you can do about that. But there are also some depth ambiguities. Um, the, I guess it swapped left and right legs here. So that's a little confusion. Um, and this leg is going backwards. But actually, the projection in, in from 3D to 2D, the leg could the lower leg could just as well be backwards as forward. So um, there's some ambiguity. But regardless, this thing is now something you can download. If you have an iPhone, you can go to the, uh, the App Store and download Mosh Camera. Uh, this is a Body Labs uh, app, which works. It's pretty slick. Uh, this is an older version of it. You take a picture. Um, it estimates your, your uh, 2D joints. It actually uses a CNN to predict the 3D and then fits the 3D more precisely, and then you can do all these Snapchat-like um, uh, things to the body. And it has a notion of 3D. You can see these balls bouncing off the body, um, and uh, this is what I would say. 2D pose detection, uh, 3D fit, and then uh, they also extended this to video, so you can shoot a video of your friends and then put silly things on. Um, butterflies are my favorite. 
part. I like the butterfly so. Uh, anyway, the video version is not on the iPhone store, sadly, but you can play with the other. See, it's got a real-time 2D CNN or 2D uh, joints, so you can see how the CNN is working. Uh, but now, coming back to the question about clothing, yeah, that's a problem. We spent all this time building models of, uh, of the uh, basically unclothed body, but this is what we really look like, um, and they see the clothing deforms quite a lot, and it mirrors our, our shape. So uh, we want to move beyond the naked body, and this is, again, some books of Girard, uh, Sir Gladys, uh, 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 an intern we had, Calentine, and Sonny, who is a, he's a body lab. So the first step of this was to solve a problem of body shape under clothes. So here's a 4D scan of a subject uh, moving around in clothing. You see a lot of detail, a lot of complicated, as you were hypothesizing, maybe the clothing deformation could be much more complex than the soft tissue deformation of the person. Uh, and on the right, we've estimated the shape of this person underneath his clothing. And the way we do that is again, we very precisely align these meshes to our template. Um, and here is a, the alignment process. So this is like aligning our dynamic scans, uh, but we're aligning it to our low dimensional human body shape. Oh, funny. But then once we do that, we can pose normalize it. And uh, let me just play this again. So once it's pose normalized, you see the cloth deforming in all kinds of ways around the body. And as I move, my clothing becomes loose and tight on different parts of my body, providing constraints about what the body shape could possibly be under the clothing. And so we do that. Um, uh, we use that to infer the shape under the clothing. Here is, again, an input sequence, our result on the right, and something that was just published at ECCB in 2016 uh, doing the same thing. Uh, we test, we, they gave us the, the code and we ran it on our data and then we also ran ours on their data and uh, they're, I, you know, they're a lot better. <laughs> I think this is pretty much solved at this point. If you have a 4D scan, uh, we get out, to, again, it's like two and a half millimeters of uh, error given to the, to the ground truth shape. So, I mean, assuming people will do some poses for us, right? Uh, if from a static pose, it won't be, won't be this. All right. Um, so now that we have, so we've got our 4D scanner, we can capture scans of the body in motion like this in clothing. We now have the ability to uh, pull out the unclothed shape underneath the body. So now we can begin to ask, how does the clothing move relative to the body? So uh, here is our subject again, uh, our estimated naked shape, and then we've segmented the body um, we segmented the clothing from the body, estimating basically three layers, a layer underneath and then the, the shirt and the pants, which are automatically segmented into parts. Uh, given that, we can model uh, how the clothing deviates from the body, and then we can take the clothing, this, those two pieces, and put them on a new body shape on the right. And doing the same poses, uh, it looks pretty cool. Or we can take somebody and then change the beta parameters to make them heavier and see what the clothing looks like on the same person uh, different weight. This then allowed us to take the Caesar data set of you know, thousands of people and uh, put clothing on them. Um, so uh, we can dress them all and uh, texture them. This is just a step in, in the direction of doing this. Now, all the clothing I just showed you had the same topology of the body, which made it a little bit simpler. Skirts and long dresses and, and scarves and things have different topologies of the body, and we have to do something a little bit special, uh, with it, which involves a slight of, small amount of manual labor to get it set up. Um, but then we could do the same thing, capture clothing on one person trans. We're still, this is not, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned one application being shopping for clothing online. Um, one of the things you'd like to maybe do there is this try-on thing, but clearly not at that level of quality yet. Um, but here we can capture a, a garment, recover a texture map for it, and then uh, present it with that texture map. Of course, we're losing a lot of these really lovely wrinkles and so on here. Um, we're not really capturing that yet. And so uh, that's work in progress, and I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. 
learning something about how clothing brings to homes. So I'm basically out of, I'm over time. Um, so uh, one, uh, but Ruth, does she, she stop? Or you, when are you going to stop me? <laughs> I could stop any time. Um, I will, I will tease you with one more thing, which is that you can use, you could take our body model and use it to generate synthetic data. Now, I said that training a CNN, you need labeled data, obviously. Uh, so here's a synthetic sequence where we took a scan of a person, we took motion capture data, and it, it looks, I mean, probably to you it doesn't look too bad. It looks like the guy's walking around with Japanese sub like that. But it's purely synthetic, and I'll, I'll skip over how we, how we do that and just tell you about something called the surreal data set, where we take our body model um, and we generate uh, synthetic video sequences and a bunch of uh, ground truth data, RGBD, surface normals, optical flow, depth data, segmentations, 2D pose, 3D pose. Uh, and so this is what the data set looks like. It doesn't look super real. So on the left is the, is the synthetic examples. We just choose random indoor images and then put people in them. And, uh, you know, it looks, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes doesn't. Uh, like that doesn't look so bad. And then that we have ground truth. This is just an example of ground truth segmentation. Um, and ground truth depth maps. And, uh, and so given this, um, we just train, uh, we always train the same network. We train a, a stacked hourglass network, and we've trained it to estimate 2D pose, 3D pose, depth, uh, off flow. Um, and so you can download this data set if you're interested in it. Uh, it includes all the 3D motions of the body and uh, shapes. And I will skip over the networks and just show you some uh, very quick examples of this working. So this is on, of course, now real data of a real person where uh, this is the ground truth shape and the ground truth depth map, and this is what the network uses. Um, so I think the depth map doesn't look bad. It's discretized into like 20 bins. Uh, seg part segmentation terrible. So you can train this thing on pretty synthetic data and, and use it on... Um, uh, on some, so I think that's a, a nice concept. Um, uh, for so I, there's a lot of stuff I didn't cover today, uh, but where is this all going? We all think about the camera as a thing that captures photons and records them. I really want to think about the camera in a very different way, as something that captures your essence. It's like you know, the, the Native Americans talked about the, the, the people stealing their soul camera. I kind of want to steal your soul. I want to, I want to capture all the nuance, all the little details, everything that makes you you, such that we can create your virtual doppelganger um, so that your experience in the virtual environment comes richer and, and more realistic. Uh, this is, um, today it's super expensive to do this at a super realistic level. So this movie, um, uh, Fast and Furious, something, four, two, three, something, yeah. Uh, so he died in the middle of it, and, and they had to rep replicate his face. Um, they shot his brother and, uh, and then digitally altered his face. This cost $50 million for a few seconds of, of like film time. So it's super expensive. I mean, it's real. it looks like they captured his essence, right? They've sold, stolen his soul. He's dead, and they're putting him in a movie. That's as close to stealing someone's soul as you can get. Um, anyway, so, uh, but it cost $50 million bucks. And, and here's, a, here's a, just a plot I like to, to look at. Here's the cost of genome sequencing, right? So that's another way of kind of stealing the soul, capturing your essence. Um, and it was super, super expensive, and then, it, and then the price just dropped. And so what I'm imagining is with these sort of computer vision techniques and machine learning and cameras, we're going to get to a point where, I mean, we're still up here at the expensive stage of, of, of building an avatar of you. You've got to come into my lab, and I've got to scan you, and it's a little hard and so on. Um, but I, I think we should be able to get down here in the next five to ten years where you can get a really realistic digital avatar. Uh, so uh, this is the slide. If you want, if you want any of the data um, and stuff, there's a lot of data and code online for all sorts of things. Um, and if there's any time, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Any other questions?
All right. What's going on? All right. Good. Thanks, guys. So uh, let's thank Michael again for his uh, great talk. Oh.